So, like I said, we're starting a brand new series today called Unhurried, and I want to begin with a question. And the question is this. If you were to describe Jesus with one word, what word would that be? And some of you might say love, and you'd be right. Some of you might say mercy or grace. Some of you might use the word Lord or perhaps master. Maybe you might use the word teacher or savior. And all of those words are certainly true about Jesus. He was the Lord. He was the master. He was the savior. What about the word relaxed? One time someone asked Dallas Willard, author of many monumental Christian books, what one word would you use to describe Jesus? And the word that he used was relaxed. How interesting. And it got me thinking about, was Jesus really relaxed? Did he go through his ministry? Did he go through his life in a relaxed sort of way. And as I started to read the Bible and study and look back at the Gospels, what I found was that he was. Jesus did live a relaxed life. Another way we could say it is that Jesus lived an unhurried life. I mean, if you think about it, Jesus waited until he was 30 years old to start his ministry. Wow, can you believe that? I mean, I started pastoring this church when I was 28 years old. I mean, what was Jesus thinking when he was, I don't know, say 27, when he's essentially a full-grown man and his friends are getting married and and they're getting into their careers and he still hasn't started his ministry? I mean, what did he do for another three years from 27 to 30? I mean, we know he worked as a carpenter, but he wasn't in a hurry. In fact, when he began his ministry, the first thing that Jesus did was spend 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting and praying in silence and solitude with his father, fighting off temptation. He was not in a hurry. In his ministry, he would often do things that baffled people. They were like, why why is he he taking his time? Like, what's going on? Remember when Mary and Martha came to him and said, you need to come. Our brother Lazarus is sick. You need to come so that you can heal him. And Jesus took his time. In fact, when he finally showed up to see Lazarus, he had been dead for four days. It's like, Jesus, he was unhurried. He lived a relaxed pace of life. Some people hear this word relaxed and they think, oh, I don't know, lazy or or unproductive, but it's, it's not true. See, Jesus was very busy. He, but he just, he wasn't in a hurry. He, in fact, at one point, Jesus, Jesus was so busy, they had people coming to him, and, and the needs were so many that, that he didn't even have time to eat. <laughs> he was incredibly busy, but he wasn't in a hurry. You know, Jesus said one time to us, to his followers, uh, and to us today, In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, he said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. When you're tired and you're worn out, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Wow, amazing. And then he says this, For my yoke is easy to bear, And the burden I give to you is light. He used words like light and easy to describe his way of life. Jesus was very busy, but he was never in a hurry. And he invites you into that same kind of life. But many of us, we're, we're not, we don't, we don't know what this life of unhurried living is. We don't know this, this pace that Jesus lived. Most of us live in a, in a hectic, hurried, sort of frenzied kind of pace. We're running from here to there. We're, we're taking our kids to school. We're going to work. We're cooking dinner. We're cleaning. We're going to the grocery store. And we're, and we're constantly in a hurry, going, going, going. We live like chickens with our heads cut off sometimes, don't we? And there's lots of reasons why we live this way. For, for some of us, it's we're, we, we are, we're sold on this idea that the faster we go, the more we can get done. 
And so that's why we're in a hurry. It's like, we, gotta, we can get more things done, and I've got this long list of to-do lists, and I've got to go here and there and there. And that's why we're in a hurry, because we just believe that we, the faster we move, the more we can do. For some of us, we, we, we've over, we, we understand that our culture values productivity. In other words, a person who gets all of these things done is kind of lifted up. It's kind of honored. Like we talk about people this way. Can you believe she can get it all done? She's the state. She's got the kids. She's got a job. She keeps her house clean. She gets the groceries bought. All this. How does she get it all done? <laughs> and we lift those people up. And we honor them. And so there's value attached to, to being productive. And so that causes us to, to hurry and to move and get more things done. For some of us, the reason we're in a hurry is because we've simply overcommitted. We've said yes to this and yes to that and yes to this and yes to this appointment, yes to this opportunity. And, and this, the simple reality is, is that our schedules are packed because we've said yes too much. And what's driving that? Well, it's fear. Fear of what? Fear of missing out. Like, it's called FOMO. Some of you have heard about this before. Well, I can't miss out that. I can't say no to that. I, I might miss out on that opportunity, and then I might not get another chance to go there or meet this person, so I have to say yes, yes, yes. And so we've overcommitted, and that's the reason we're in a hurry. We've got so much going on. Another reason we're in a hurry sometimes is because we're disorganized. We just, we simply don't have a plan. We haven't thought through our month. We haven't thought through our weeks. We haven't thought through our days and what are the priorities. We haven't scheduled our priorities. And so we're behind and things have piled up. And now we're kind of, we're losing track of things and we're forgetting appointments and we're just in a hurry because we're so disorganized. Anybody out there willing to admit that? Disorganization is the cause of our hurry sometimes. And then some of us are in a hurry because we've overvalued money. Like, the, as the saying goes, time is money, right? So, so it's like, hurry up, hurry up, we gotta go, we gotta go, because we gotta make more money, time is money. And money is, is our sense of security, money gives us safety, money gives us meaning, money gives us a sense of identity, right? And we've overvalued the dollar, and so we're in a hurry, because time is money. Whatever the reason, whatever the cause of, of your hurried sickness, and that's what it is, this, this condition of soul where we're, we're kind of frantic and hectic and going, Whatever the reason is, you know deep down in your heart, it is not a good place to be. It is not healthy for your soul. It is not healthy for your body. It causes stress. I mean, have you ever met a happy, hurried person? <laughs> I mean, those things are like, they don't go together. Dallas Willard said one time, he said, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. You know what this series is all about? This series is about explaining this quote. What does that mean? Like when, when you and I are in a hurried state, when the condition of our soul is hurried, it's, a, it's an enemy. It's the enemy of the spiritual life. We're going to unpack that statement each week and talk about the reasons why this is actually true. Today we're going to talk about the first one. It's in your notes there. The reason that, that, that hurry is an enemy to your spiritual life is because when you're in a hurry, you and I, we make poor choices. We make mistakes. Isn't it true? You're like, yeah, I mean, we tell our kids this. Come on, slow down. If you're in a hurry, you're going to make bad choices. You're going to make mistakes. We try to tell our kids, slow down. When we're in a hurry, we stub our toe, we bang our knee, we trip over things, right? We make mistakes when, a, when we're in a hurry. We forget our keys, we forget our wallet, we forget our phone. When our, why? Because we're in a hurry. We get into car accidents because we're in a hurry. Many years ago, I remember it was late at night. Jack and I were watching television and this commercial came on and it was, I'll never forget it. It seared into my memory. It was an Arby's commercial. And you can get five roast beef sandwiches for $5. I was blown away. 9.30 at night, I'm like, honey, I want some roast beef. I'm hungry. I get in my car. I put it in reverse. Garage door goes up. I hit the gas. And boom! I smash into my other car that was parked in the driveway. It cost me thousands of dollars to fix both cars. Why did that happen? Here's why. Here's why. I was in a hurry. And I know you can trace back mistakes that you've made to the fact that you were in this mindset, this zone of being in a hurry. 
We make huge mistakes in our life when it comes to taking a job because we were in a hurry. I had to get a job. I had to get a job. We took the wrong one. We make, when it comes to like the home that we buy, sometimes people get in such a hurry when they're buying a home. They, they make the wrong choice. They buy too much house. They get in a payment they can't afford. When it comes to a job or a situation, we take the wrong job. When it, hey, well, sometimes when it comes to a spouse, we get in a hurry. Well, I don't want to be alone. I, want to, I got to be with somebody. I want to, and so we hurry up and we marry the wrong person. So for some of us, we, we're employers and we get such in a hurry sometimes to, to hire the right person. We got to fill a spot. We got to fill a spot. We end up hiring the wrong person. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 19, verse, verse 2 says. Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. Listen, if that's all you get today, listen, haste makes mistakes. When you are in a hurry, you make poor choices. It ruins us. It hurts our lives. It's the great enemy to the spiritual life, this thing called hurry. There's a great example in the Bible of someone who made a terrible choice. Two people, their names were, at the time of this situation, Abram and Sarai. Their names would later become Abraham and Sarah. Some of you know the choice that they made. Essentially, here's how it goes down. God comes to Abram and says, I am going to bless you, and through your descendants, I'm going to bless the whole world. I'm going to give you a son. He's the son of promise. He's the seed It's going to be wonderful. Abraham receives this. It's going to be great, awesome. Sarai receives this. A decade goes by. No children, no son, no child. Ten years of waiting. Finally, they're like, look, we got to do something. They get in a hurry, and they come up with this plan. Genesis chapter 16. Let's look. What happens? So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go sleep with my servant. Well, there's a brilliant idea (laughs) because that always goes well, right? Listen to her thinking here. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah's proposal. In the same way that Adam took the fruit from Eve and ate the fruit. I mean, what's wrong with this guy? He doesn't step up and say, time out. This is a bad plan. This is not a good idea. This is not going to end well. What happened to this guy? He agrees with the plan. And so Sarai gives her servant Hagar to Abram and they get together. And sure enough, she gets pregnant. The plan goes awry because when Hagar gets pregnant, she feels like she's got this privileged position, like this favored position, and she starts to treat Sarai with contempt and look down upon her, like, hey, you're the barren one, I'm the pregnant one, you know, and their relationship becomes extremely tense. It becomes so tense. Of course it becomes tense, right? It becomes so tense that Sarai is infuriated and drives Hagar away. I love verse 5. Listen to verse 5. Guys, pay attention to this. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. Listen to what she says. Watch. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. To which I'm thinking, honey, this was your idea. Like, you came up with this plan. You gave me Hagar. She, she's pregnant. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. How is this my fault? Listen, that doesn't work, does it, guys? <laughs> it doesn't matter that it was the girl's fault, the woman's fault. Here, here, listen, guys, pay attention. Take notes real quick. This is super, super, this is like insight for, for, for fathering and, and husbanding all this stuff. Listen, it's always your fault. <laughs> Okay, even when it's not your idea, it's your fault. And it really is Abraham's fault, by the way. He heard this plan and he agreed with it. Come on. In what situation does this thing go down good? Does it, does it go well for, for them? Zero? He should have known. Anyway, just thought that you'd, I'd help you guys out with that. It's always your fault. Fault. So, so Hagar's on the run. She's running away from Sarai. An angel of God comes to Hagar and says, hey, where are you going? 
She says, while I'm on the run from my master's wife, she hates me, you know, she's drove me out of town, all this stuff. The angel says, I want you to go back and I want you to submit to Sarai's authority and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to bless your, your child. He's going to be, you know, the father of all these descendants, more descendants than, than there are stars in the sky. And he, he tells him, gives, gives uh, Hagar this promise. And so she goes back and, and then the angel says this. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Verse 12, this son of yours, which would eventually become Ishmael, she gives birth to Ishmael. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fists against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all of his relatives. What an incredible statement. The angel essentially gives a prophecy and says, All of the descendants of Ishmael will be people who are bent towards fighting. They'll be bent towards being at odds with their neighbors. There will always be war with all of these descendants, especially with their relatives. Now, who are the relatives of the descendants of Ishmael? They are the Jewish people. And so for thousands of years after this, literally thousands of years, the descendants of Ishmael were at war with the descendants of Isaac, the the son of Isaac. Of promise. And even today, you still see this going on in the Middle East, remnants of this, of this tension, this racial tension between the two people groups. And all of it gets traced back to this one choice, this one decision. They, they, they said, I've got a plan, you know, let's, let's hurry up God's plan, take Hagar, be with her, and have a child. They got in a hurry. And think of all of the bloodshed and all of the war and all of the hatred and all of the pain that has come from that one decision. I had a friend one time that I was talking to about a decision I needed to make and I was eager and I was anxious to to make the decision and I was asking his counsel and you know what he said to me off the cuff? He said, hey, be careful. You don't want to create an Ishmael. I was like, whoa, what does that mean? So what are you talking about? Well, think about what happened. You, made a, you make a poor choice here. There will be consequences. See, the reason that hurry is a great enemy to the spiritual life is because when we get in a hurry, we make mistakes, we make poor choices, and it hurts us and it hurts the people around us. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid getting in a hurry and making poor choices? Well, it starts with you and I surrendering control. You must surrender control. See, the reason that Sarai and Abram made this decision is they, they, they took control of the situation. They stopped trusting God. They said, I know God told us we would have a son, but, you know, it's not happening. And so let's, let's do something ourselves. Let's take control of the situation. And they did. And they made a poor choice. And the results were devastating. See, what you and I need to do is surrender control of our lives to God. I love what Psalm 46.10 says. It says, be still and know, be still and rest in the knowledge that I am God. Another translation says, calm down and relax and remember who's in charge. That's what that means. God, I'm not God. I'm going to know that you are God and that you're in control of my life. I'm not going to take the reins of my life. I'm not going to try to make it happen. I'm not going to be the one who's in charge. You're in charge of my life. In John chapter 5, there's this great story of, of healing in the first couple of verses of John chapter 5. And Jesus performs this miraculous healing. And the only problem is, is that he does it on the Sabbath. And all the religious leaders, they get all upset. Oh, he's healed somebody on the Sabbath. You know, all they cared about was the rules and regulations. They didn't care about people. They had no love in their hearts. So they get on Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus responds. He says, look, my father is always working. And so am I. John 5, verse 17. He's like, I'm not going to take a day off on the Sabbath from loving people and helping people and healing people. And then he goes on to say a few more things about how his working relationship with the father works and 
And then in verse 30, Jesus probably gives us one of the most insightful uh, peaks or insights into how he functioned in his ministry, how he actually went about doing the things that he did. Listen to John chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, listen, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. There's so much here. First of all, he says, I can do nothing on my own. Really? What? You're Jesus. You can do anything you want. Like you're the, the creator. You're, you're the master. You're the Lord. You're, you're a savage. You can do anything you want. He says, no. I come, I don't do anything on my own. He says, when I make a judgment, it's, it's the judgment of God. Well, I used to get confused about that word judge. Like, I don't judge, I, I don't make a, I used to think it was about like making judgments about people, but it's, it, that's not what it means. What, when Jesus uses the word judge or judgment in this, in this context, what he's saying is my, my, my discernment or my, my choices about what to do and what to say. My choice to, to say something or to do something is just, it's on point because I'm doing exactly what the Father's telling me to do. I'm listening to him tell me and, and speak to me and, and show me what to say and what to do and then I'm saying it and doing it. Like, I don't do anything by myself. I didn't come to fulfill my own will. I came to fulfill the, the will of my Father. You see in your notes there, Jesus surrendered total control of his life to the Father. You say, well, of course he did. He was Jesus. He was God. He, he could do whatever he wanted to do. Okay, that's, that's fine. We can say that. But you have to remember that Jesus forfeited his rights as God in a sense. Not completely, but for the most part. He didn't consider equality with God something to be leveraged or taken advantage of. He let it go and he, he lived his life as a man. He got tired. He had to eat. He got hungry. He did that to model for us how we should live our lives. He says, here's how I went through my life. I just simply listened to the Father speak, and then based on what he said or instructed, then I would think or teach or do whatever he said he wanted done. And here's the amazing thing. Because he did that, he never made a poor choice. His judgment was just. His decisions were right. His choices were on point. He never made a mistake or a poor choice. All of his decisions were in alignment with God. And, he, and then, and then, the truth of the matter is, the Father invites you into the same rhythm. <laughs> the same life. He says, that's the way it was for my son, and that's the way it's going to be for you. To, to enter into a life where you hear what I have to say, you hear what I have to think about uh, and what to do, and then you carry out my will, not your own. This is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. Some of you have it memorized, but maybe not, not, not worked out into your everyday life. Listen to the words of the Lord's Prayer, which it isn't the Lord's Prayer. It's our prayer that we pray. Our Father who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven what does that mean now think with me a kingdom implies a king someone who's in charge someone who has a will someone whose will is executed or or you know performed our prayer is, God, your kingdom come, not mine. I'm not here to fulfill my own plans or build my own little kingdom. I'm here to fulfill your will, what you want done. See, the word kingdom and the word will are used as synonyms. It's the same thing. God, I'm your servant, and I'm here, and I'm surrendering total control of my life to your will on earth as it is in heaven. And when we do that, that's when we begin to make incredible choices. We begin to, to, to choose and make decisions 
that are in alignment with what God wants for our life when it comes to our relationships or when it comes to our parenting or when it comes to our, our marriages or when it comes to our jobs or whatever. Our, our choices are in alignment with God. Why? Because we've surrendered control. We're not acting like God. We're, we're seeking him. We're, we're seeking his counsel and his will. And so our choices become aligned with his. Now, some of you struggle to do that, and I understand. And I think the struggle is, well, if I surrender my will and if I surrender my wants and if I give up control, I don't know if God's going to take care of me. I don't know if he's going to get me that job. I don't know if, I, if, he, if, if the relationship is going to, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do the things I want to do or, or buy the things I want to buy. Then I got I to gotta check with God. Maybe he, won't, maybe he won't take care of me. Maybe he won't satisfy my desires. I can't give up control of my life. Hmm. The reality is, you don't trust him. You don't trust that if you surrender your will to his will, you don't trust that if you give him total control, that he's got your back. It's an issue of trust. Later on in chapter 6, after the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says these amazing words in verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. <laughs> Powerful words. The number one thing that you, can, that you should seek in your life is my kingdom. My rule, my reign, my will. Seek that. Align your life with what I'm doing in the world. Surrender total control to me. And live righteously. Live in the ways that I have planned for you. And then he gives this promise. And this is for those of you who struggle with surrender. You struggle with control. You struggle to give God control of your life. Just like Hagar. Just like, just like Sarai. Just like Abram. Right? They took control. Watch this. And he will give you everything that you need. Another version says, and all of these things will be added unto you. What, is the, what are all of these things that you need? Food and clothing and shelter, a job, relationships. God is saying, look, if you align yourself with my will, if you surrender control to me, if you be still and know that I'm God, if you will quiet yourself, and relax and remember who's in control, I will bless you with everything that you need. And you know what ends up happening eventually as you do this one step at a time? This is tough stuff. One step at a time. What you desire begins to change. What you think you need starts to change. And then you begin to want what God wants for your life. And that is what he delights to give you. God delights to give you what he wants for your life. And guess what? As you surrender, you start to want what he wants for your life. And you start to relax. And you start to live unhurried because you've surrendered control and you end up making incredible decisions. Decisions that are in alignment with his will. You know, some people think when they hear this word relaxed or unhurried, they think, they think of, I don't know, laziness or, 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 or doing less or, um, and there certainly is a place for doing less in the series and we're gonna talk about that in a couple of weeks. But I want to end today by just saying this. An unhurried life is not a life about doing less. Oh, I need to do less. I just need to stop, stop, stop. We'll get to that later. We'll talk about that. But it's not necessarily about doing less, but rather about doing things in a different way. Jesus was very busy, but he was never in a hurry. Why? Because he, was, he had his will totally surrendered to the will of God. And so he was very active, but it was, it was a surrendered activity. He was making great choices. He wasn't stressed out if things didn't go his way. 
He showed up four days late. Lazarus had died. (laughs) He was very busy, but he was never in a hurry. It's not about doing less. It's about doing things in a different way, with a different posture, with a different mindset. It's a mindset of trust. My question to you today is, will you surrender control? Will you surrender your will to the will of God? If you do, you will enter into a life that is unhurried, which leads to great choices and great decisions. You know, right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to that. I'm going to have our our worship teams come out, and they're going to to, uh, lead us in a song that talks about being still. It talks about surrendering control of your life to God. And I'm going to give you a moment right here, right now, to respond. And as this song, as we're singing this song, I want you to just step into it and say, God, I'm giving my life. I'm trusting you with it. I'm surrendering total control of my life. I'm declaring that you are God and I am not. You're in control and I am not. Will you sing with us?
song because I think it's the perfect way to wrap up this message. Even if you listen to the first words of the song, it says, be still and know that the Lord is in control. I mean, that's that's essentially the, the crux of the message for today. We have got to acknowledge that God is in control and we are not. And it really is a question of trust. And the thing that I keep going back to from this message, and I, I really needed to hear it myself because I, I fall into the trap of hurry and busyness all the time, was that Jesus surrendered complete control of his life to the Father. And what a perfect example and what a, what a perfect roadmap for us to follow. And so the question is, are you going to trust that he is in control of your life today? And if you don't know Jesus, are you going to choose to acknowledge the supreme sacrifice that he made for you? Because Jesus died for each and every single one of us. He died for us on a cross, taking the penalty of sin and death so that you could have an eternal relationship with the same father that he relinquished control of his life to. And when he rose again three days later, paying that penalty, he guaranteed that you will have an eternal relationship and that you can give God an eternal control of your life. And if you ask him for forgiveness of your sins today, you can enter into that relationship right now and you can give up this false sense of control. You don't have to carry it anymore. So what I'd like for us to do is everyone please bow your heads. If you have a relationship with Christ, take this moment right now to go to him in prayer and just acknowledge that he is in control. Give it all to him right now. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but you think now might be that time for you, I would ask that you take these words and make them your own. Father, I ask for your forgiveness. I have sinned. I have fallen victim to believing that I am in control of my life. And Father, I just ask that you cleanse me. You wash me. I ask that you help me to align my life with your will for the rest of my days. Father, I am eternally grateful for you and for this moment. It's in your name that we humbly pray. Amen. Now it's said that in heaven they celebrate anytime somebody makes this decision, so we want to celebrate with you right now. 